Hey construction legends, so what do people like? People like free stuff and what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a series where I interviewed some high level experts for basically some free consulting for you. So today we have a lady called Ruth King. Now bear with me as I give you this introduction. She's got an MBA in finance. She has a bachelor's and master's degree in chemical engineering. She's a serial entrepreneur. She has eight business. She's written five books specifically around construction businesses. She's helped a HVAC contractor grow from 750 grand to over 10 million in annual revenue. She essentially helps construction companies with their profitability. So she understands understands the insides of how the finances of construction companies work. So we're going to talk to her about why volume is vanity and profits are sanity. What's happening in the construction market right now with high interest rates and high inflation, how you can thrive in that environment. A famous quote from Jeff Bezos, which impacted one of our clients. And at the end, I ask her, what is the one thing that you would do to increase profitability? If you had to give one piece of advice, what would that be? Check it out. Hope you enjoy. Hi, Ruth. Welcome to the show. Hi, it's great to see you. It is. Great it's to be we're... back. Actually, I had the opportunity of interviewing you, and now I guess you're turning the tables on me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You mentioned in an article, volume is vanity, profits are sanity. Tell us a bit more about that. If you don't look at your bottom line, it doesn't matter what your top line is. So a lot of people say I grew my business by 10, 15, 20%, but their bottom line stayed absolutely the same, which is why it, the reality of it is if you're going to grow your top line, you should grow your bottom line or keep your top line the same and grow your bottom line. I, you know, And there's contractors I work with who we've actually lowered their revenues and increased their profits. I would much have rather have higher profits than I would higher revenue because that's what you get to keep. The revenue piece of it goes away because you got to pay all your expenses and what's left is profit. Mm. And that leads you into another question about our good friend Jeff Bezos, who formerly said in the Amazon early days that I don't care if we ever make a profit. And I think you had a client who grew rapidly, similar sort of a story, maybe not maybe not as large. But <laughs> no. <laughs> but can you tell us well, about it was that? Really, it was really funny because in the early days, Jeff, you know, famously said, I don't care whether we ever make a profit. I don't care. I don't care. And you know, to me, that didn't make any sense whatsoever. So I started digging. And if you read his annual reports, which I did, in the bottom and the footnotes in one of his annual reports, he managed instead of net profit per hour, he managed cash flow per hour. So as long as his cash flow per hour was increasing, it didn't matter if he ever made a profit. Now, most of us don't have millions and millions and millions of dollars behind us. So had he stopped growing, he would have imploded, but it didn't happen that way. And I had that happen on a much smaller base to a client who is now retired. They started their business with zero, grew it rapidly to $2 million, and they never looked at their financial statements. As long as they had cash in the bank, as long as they could pay their bills, as long as they could take their vendor discounts, they were happy campers. Mm -hmm. And then they hit about $2 million and the growth stopped. And then within a couple of months, they couldn't always take their discounts. They were scrounging for payroll every once in a while and going, this doesn't make sense. Well, they were doing the same thing Jeff was. It was they were looking at their cash flow rather than their profitability. And when you are growing, the cash from one job starts the next. And as long as the cash keeps going and growing and growing and growing, you continue to have more and more cash. But as soon as you stop growing and that cash evens out, long story story short to this one is that they were smart enough to make a phone call because they knew something was wrong. And so they ended up calling me. And when I did the analysis, they were losing a nickel for every dollar they took in the door for 12 years. 12 years. 12 years. Can you imagine how much more profit they could have had? Yeah, I am. So in, in construction, what we found a lot, so from my side of it is you know, we we are in the disputes and contracts and mm -hmm. all that, all that, all that fun stuff that happens. And the biggest thing we talk about. So when we're trying to diagnose a problem, we have a series of questions that we ask. And one is we try and understand our clients 
point of view, understand, then understand their client's point of view, what their clients say, we understand what the contract says. But then we also say, we try and establish what's happening with cash flow. Mm -hmm. Because cash flow in construction, from our side of the, of the trying to manage the contract point of view, is so important because it's kind of like a, it's how they can put you over a barrel. If they can not pay you, if they can slow things down and then stop the money coming in, all of a sudden you kind of have to make a deal to make payroll or to whatever, you've no wiggle room. How can construction companies battle that? How can they build up a bit of a cash flow reservoir? Yeah, I mean, the, what you're talking about is so true. I had one of my clients had three GCs go file bankruptcy on him within a week and it took him out. Same week, three went. And he, you know, he didn't have a million dollars in cash to cover payroll and everything else. And yeah, at some point in time, he got paid a little bit, but give me a break. He had to make payroll this week. So the reality of it is what I suggest that all contractors do is they save 1% of every dollar that comes in the door, period, no matter what. And at some point in time, that 1% becomes hundreds of thousands of dollars and then don't spend it. I had one buy a boat. <laughs> Piss me off. <laughs> okay, well, I guess you can sell the boat. <laughs> yeah. The boat. yeah. <laughs> but in, real, in all reality is, you know, we also deal a lot with retainage. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that also, they, you know, you know, GCs love to keep retainage as much yep. as I do. And so what we do with retainage is obviously we make sure that without that 10%, we can still pay our bills. And yep. a lot of times a good portion of that retainage gets saved. That's because they work. Because you, you wait, for, wait for a year or whoever to get it. But all, yeah, also, uh, you know, the scary thing is, and we can talk about margins now in a second, is that a lot of times the retainage is the profit. Mm -hmm. And so you haven't made a you know, you have made no money until you actually hit your retainage, which is a full year later, potentially. Yeah. So we know from the industry drainage, GCs tend to not make as high a margin as, as subcontractors. So between 10 and 20 percent, depending on how good they are. Subcontractors, depending on what they're doing. And I think we've done a bit of analysis on, on this within our company as well. Subcontractors tend to go from anywhere 10 as well up to 30 percent margins. And typically the subcontractors have the higher margins are the guys that do the envelope of a building. So mm -hmm. anything to do with the, the facade, basically. They see the windows, roofing, anything on the outside seems to have a reasonable margin. Uh, I can speculate why that is, but that's not what we're seeing in the market at the moment. We're seeing now we're seeing yeah. a great amount of pricing pressure right now. Margins are dropping precipitously, and I don't know any other word to say about it. I had one of my clients literally Really, I mean, the prices were going for nothing and they had to drop their profits to almost nothing to be able to get work. And I think it's a reaction to a lot of things that are going on in the U.S. Our inflation rate is 8%. Everybody's screaming recession. They're still bidding, at least around here, but nothing's quote unquote being awarded because um, cash to somebody who's going to be borrowing money right now is north of 10%. And that gets expensive very, very quickly. Now in the UK, it's worse because mm. they're inflation is what, I think 10, 11 now. Mm. And, you know, to borrow money, it'll be like 14, 15 and, and you can't make money like that. So that's why we're seeing margins, I think, go very, very small until money starts freeing up again. There's also a, a massive supply glut from COVID. And there's a bit of a, um, before interest rates started going up and before anything, the cost of everything started going up in the construction, before any other industry, in most instances, we, we saw it very, very quickly. At some stage, that has to rebound. At some stage, there needs to be a, a correction. Is there any sort of, in your market, is there anything that you're seeing at all is a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel? It depends upon where you are in the U.S. And I don't know what Australia is like. But if you're in the southern U.S. right now, like in Florida, it's still really, really tight. If you're in the north, like Washington, Seattle, Boise, you know, the, the north part of the U.S., it's going great gangbusters now. I mean, they're doing really, really well. They're releasing a lot of funds. And also the state of Washington has given a whole lot of grants too. So I think a lot of it has to do with what the states are doing and what they're funding with respect to uh, how much money they're giving away to keep the economy going. Mm, okay, all right. But Florida's hurting. Yeah, we're, in, we're seeing in Australia, in Texas, in the US, a lot of things tightening up. It's a difficult market, but how can contractors in this market 
protect themselves or even thrive in this business. A lot of people, a lot of famous people, Warren Buffett and a lot of investors will say that uh, the fortunes are made in recessionary times. How can construction companies protect themselves and, and thrive? What I've told my clients who are in construction is this. Number one, who are your good customers? Are they doing any jobs that are not related to having to go out and borrow money to do the jobs. Now, granted, they're smaller jobs as a general rule, but it's much better to get a smaller job and keep working and keep you know, your overhead paid than sitting there complaining about we have no work. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking them to do that. They're in for some colleges right now, and there is a lot of grant money that they don't have to go out for bids for. So that's available for a lot of the black colleges in the United States right now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, go after the work that's not bid oriented. Go see whether there are renovations that you can do. Granted, it's not the cool stuff. You know, it's not, you know, putting the envelope together, so to speak. But, you know, maybe there's stuff internally or some smaller projects that they're working on that they'd say, I didn't know you'd work on something that small. And until you talk to them and find out what's going on from their perspective and what they're working on and seeing whether you can bid on any of that that's what i'm doing it's just like going out and knocking on the doors rather than just waiting for the bids to come in right now yeah so a bit of outbound a bit of outbound marketing which is which is one of our biggest acquisition channels to be honest as a company and so speaking of acquisition channels which is one of the things i talk about a lot is the vicious cycle of bidding or tendering and so what does happen is if you're not decommoditized if you're just the same as the next guy and you're just comparing price. If you get a job with the lowest price, you have a smaller margin, which means ultimately you probably deliver not a good a service because you don't have as much of a margin. You can't get as good people. You can't get as good equipment. And you fall into this spiral of death on the way down because you've not done as good a job. You didn't get as good a reputation for doing the work. Then the next one comes around and then, then, then. And so many construction companies are in that spiral of death and also that's the only way they win work is via bidding. I know, it's scary. Which means that in markets like this, when you, there's no bids to be bidding on or less and less, then it becomes very, very hard. And I read in one of your articles about referrals. So strategically, how can construction companies implement referrals into a business? Like, what, How do you practically do it? You have to physically go out and knock on doors. You really and truly do from a construction perspective. Hey, we just finished this job for you. You know, may, say it's 30 days later, say, call them on the phone and say, Hey, you know, how's everything going? How'd the job go? Who have you talked to about the work that we did for you? And they have talked to somebody. It could be a neighbor. It could be a fellow GC, it could be, but they've talked to somebody. Can I get an introduction to somebody, mm -hmm. whoever that is? And you physically, one person refers to the next, which refers to the next, which refers to the next. It's almost like a daisy chain. I don't know any other way to describe it, but you you physically say, okay, I'm going to have two conversations about a referral a week and one presentation to a new person a week. And then mm -hmm. at some point in time, even in slower economies, you're going to get work. Mm -hmm. You just are. It's, it's a numbers game. Yeah, exactly. It is that repeated action. It's not something you do once. It's something that is it's kind of evergreen that you, you constantly do. One thing that we often advise our clients as well is that at the start of the project, before anything has happened, you say to them, hey, if we're doing a good job for you, like I'm not asking you to refer us, would you refer us? And then mid job is when you ask for the referral, not at the end. Mm -hmm. And that's when you seem to get quite a bit of action as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. And yeah. the other thing that I have seen happen, and I'm not sure, it depends upon what the subs are doing, but a lot of times if they, I've seen them do lunch and learns, you know, here's some things that can help you on your next project, or here's some things and ways to save money on X, or they'll have an economist come in and talk about, you know, what's going on with the economy and recession. But once a quarter, they'll do a lunch and learn and they'll invite everybody. Great idea. That's a fantastic and, idea. And it's amazing how much work comes out of that. Mm, it's so true. A couple of concepts that I really like. One is a concept by a guy called Alan Dibb. We wrote, he's a friend of mine, he wrote the, the book called The 4-Hour Work Week. And I must, mm -hmm. I must try to get him on because he's a marketing guru. And he talks about cornerstone marketing. Mm -hmm. And when I was growing up in Ireland, there was a company called Bruce Shaw 
and they, they've changed their names to Line Titan. They're all over the world now. And what they were, they were contracts people, they were estimators. They drew up the bill of quantities. That was their neck of the woods. But what they did every year or twice a year was they produced a book to the market, which was the cost per linear meter, the cost per ton, the cost per whatever of, you know, building whatever, like building a house, building a, a commercial building, whatever. And it became then the Bible. This is where people can go to do their estimates from. And because of that, they got so much work because when people are thinking about, well, who do we go to get our estimates done? They go, well, these guys literally wrote the book on it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there's so many construction companies that can do something like that. If you're a scaffolding company, you can create some sort of document every quarter or, or some sort of training or something. If you can be the guy that trains scaffolding supervisors, they're going to look at you and go, oh, th these are guys that do the training of the scaffolding supervisors. Therefore, they must be pretty good you know you get a lot of expertise in in, in that way that makes sense yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And if you do it that way, that makes a lot of sense. You do the lunch and learns. That makes a lot of sense also. And you can bring in different people who have different expertise in building the building, whether it's the envelope or the internals, you know, one of the two. Yeah. You said at the start about tweaking some things to increase your profitability. Mm -hmm. So if there was one thing or if you can walk us through your process of if you're going into a business and you're seeing a business, maybe the top line is pretty good, but the bottom line is, is not good. What sort of things are you looking for? What sort of levers are you looking to pull to change that ratio, that, that dynamic? The first thing that I look at is what is their billable hour percentage? Because the subs, especially, you don't generate revenue without a billable, you know, somebody producing an hour's worth of work. So if their billable hour percentages for their field labor is less than 80%, we have a problem. That is the very first place that I look. 90, I wouldn't say as much as 90 a good portion of the time, north of 50%, probably north of 70% of the time. It is exactly that problem. Problem number two has to do with inventory and theft. Things disappear. Amazingly enough, they get you know sent to a job and they just, I don't know, who signed for it? You've heard that story. Yes. And so if you go, <laughs> if you go back to the first one, the, the billable. So when you say the 80%, is, are you talking about gross profit? No, I'm talking about just specific billable hours. If I give you a timesheet that says I worked eight hours, can I bill the customer all of those eight hours or not? Right. In construction, the answer, if it's not service oriented, the, the answer for construction better be pretty close to eight hours. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's And so why would it not be? And a lot of times there as well, is that just an analysis regardless if it's a lump sum cost anyway, you still want to look at that analysis. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. absolutely want to look at that because on the way to the job, they stop at the donut shop. They stop at the gas station. They stop here. They stop there. And so they're eight hours of productive time and it goes down to six. Yeah. So you're yep. paying them for eight, but there's two hours of non-productive time that cause you to take longer on the job, number one, or, you know, cause overtime issues, which are expensive. Mm -hmm. And they don't care, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're getting paid. And if, if there was one thing that you would say for construction companies to do, is you, you were say that one, if all of these construction companies just focused on this one thing to increase their profitability, what would that one thing be? Billable hours. Billable Without hours. Without a doubt, try to how, billable. How do you change that metric? Like, what is it? How do you go about, you look at your billable hours, they're not where you want them to be. How do you change the metric? First thing you do is you post it, right? And, you, you know, let's say it's 60% and we know that that's bad. Yeah. And so you just put everywhere somebody can see, you just put this big orange piece of paper with 60% on it. And everybody's going to go, what? What's that? What's yeah. the 60%? Da, 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 da. And you start explaining where it is. I find, depending upon the company, if it's over 80% and it's supposed to be over 90%, if we give them a bonus based on billable hours, i.e. over 90% or something along those lines, then they have a tendency to start paying attention to it. Mm. And then they start improving because what you pay attention to gets better. Yeah. So yep. that's how I normally do it. Fantastic. Ruth, it's been fantastic having you on the podcast. Some very valuable insights. Where would people go if they need some of your help? The best place to go is ruthking.info because it has everything that I 
do. It has the financially fit business. It has all of my books. It has all of my manuals. It has all of my speaking. It has all of everything in there. It's kind of like my little portal with me having, and you can go in and click on anything you want. It's just ruthking.info. So guys, if you need help tightening up your bottom line, check out Ruth King. Ruth, nice having you on the show. Chat to you soon. Thank you. Hey, construction legends. I hope you enjoyed that. If you want more of the same, please click here to have another cool video. And we've also got a full contract negotiation training course. It's six weeks, everything you need to do to negotiate your own contract. It's a playlist. Click on it, go through all the training and it'll make you way, way better and, and allow you to sign way less riskier contracts and set yourselves up for success. Okay. So choose one of them and go for, go forth and conquer. <laughs>